Right. So today I'll be giving this talk on fluid responsiveness that you have to fill to the gills. So this talk I gave in Hyderabad on 23rd June 2019 in their Hicks meet. So I think uh, we need to understand the meaning of fluid responsiveness. So fluid responsiveness is a physiological state where you look at the cardiac output responsiveness to the fluids that we give. So that is what we understand by fluid responsiveness. So we understand that giving less fluid in a patient who would need fluid to improve their cardiac output would be harmful. So if someone is fluid deficit and you are dealing with an unstable patient, not giving fluids would be harmful. But on the same note, if you give a lot of fluids, I think it is also harmful. So I think the main crux of the whole responsiveness is to give the amount of fluid a patient needs. It should not be less, it should not be more. So it should be optimal. I think that is where our whole effort has been over last two decades to see what is the best tool that we have which would determine the right amount of fluid that should be given. So giving more fluids, I think there are these three studies which have shown by giving more fluid, it can increase the duration of mechanical ventilation or it can increase the risk of patient going on a ventilator and it concomitantly increases the risk of mortality. And this has been found in all these groups of patients. So it increases mortality in sepsis patients, ERDS patients, patients with intra-abdominal hypertension or in acute kidney injury. So I think these are the situations we deal in ICU regularly. And these are the patients where we need to ascertain what is the right amount of fluid because we wouldn't want patients to end up with overload or we wouldn't want patients to have less fluids on board. So I think that is where the whole efforts has been for the last many years to see what is the ideal tool that we have to determine the optimal amount of fluid any patient would need. So I think the whole philosophy of fluid resuscitation or fluid responsiveness uh, would be determined by this Frank Sterling curve. So if you look at this curve, I think there are two major domains that you need to look at. So you need to look at patient who has normal LV function. So if someone has a normal systolic function, then as you see their response to a fluid resuscitation or fluid bolus would be very good as opposed to patients with poor ventricular function. If someone has a poor ventricular function, then their response to a fluid, their cardiac output responsiveness to the fluid fluid bolus would be suboptimal. And this, these are the patients where you need advanced hemodynamic variables to determine if they at all respond to fluid response, fluid bolus. So that's where you, you would subject these patients to uh, these tests to determine whether they would respond to a fluid bolus, whether there would be a cardiac output response to a fluid bolus, so that we will look into it. So I think this is again determined by this figure if you see. So if you have a patient with normal systolic function, their response to a fluid bolus as you see, their stroke volume response is much better. And as you go up on the curve, the response would get less. So you would ideally want any patient who you think would respond to fluid be in this ascending part of this curve. And if you have a patient with decreased ventricular function, as you see, the response to the fluid bolus, even in the ascending limb, is much lesser than the patients with normal LV function. As you see, the fluid response even in the ascending limb is much less and it becomes almost negligible in the upper part of the curve. So this is what we need to understand. So any fluid responsiveness is in the light of whether patient has normal LV function where the preload responsiveness or cardiac output responsiveness is much better. We service patients with a poor LV function where their response, cardiac output response to a fluid will be very suboptimal. So I think that is what we need to understand. So then the question one would ask is when would you test a patient for fluid responsiveness? I think if patient is having obvious hypovolemia or obvious blood loss, it is very intuitive. You don't check them for whether they are fluid responsiveness. So if there is an obvious hypovolemia and there is a patient who is presenting to ER or from the community with obvious features of septic shock or hypovolemic, you wouldn't subject them to 
determine whether they are fluid responsive you would start giving fluid boluses and then determine later whether further boluses would be needed but i think the group of patients who would need testing are patients who have hemodynamic instability even after initial resuscitation or where patients have features of hypoperfusion in terms of poor capillary refill reduced urine output increased lactate or patients who are having mottling obvious mottling i think that is where you would subject patients for test for fluid responsiveness so i think this is what you need to understand and another thing we need to understand is even in patients who are hemodynamically unstable and who have any of these features and you subject them to various tests for fluid responsiveness only half of the patients are fluid responsive so even these patients who are unstable despite your initial resuscitation where you want to further subject them to see if they would need some more fluid on board only half of the patients would be responding to fluids so this is what we need to understand even though you have all the other gadgets and fancy tests to determine who is responsive so only half of them you'll be able to determine whether they are responsive to fluids or not so the flow chart that you would look into is in any patients who is hemodynamically unstable so obviously you would put them on a arterial catheter and uh, plus or minus central venous catheter and uh, if you are measuring cvp or you are subjecting them to a test for fluid responsiveness so if they have low cvp or you have looked into ivc and their ivc is collapsible so then you know they are fluid responsiveness so there's no rocket science hypovolemia is present and you would give fluids and then you would give a fluid challenge the problem is when you have a cvp which is showing high or when you show uh, see an ivc which is sort of dilated then you wouldn't be sure whether you would have to give more fluid to this patient that's when you would do an echocardiogram for that patient and you will see if the chambers are small if they have kissing ventricles or kicking kissing papillary muscles then you would give them fluid considering their lv function is good and ventricles are empty you would fluid challenge them but if uh, on echocardiogram if you see a patient with large ventricles and a poor lv and maybe a high filling pressure or left ventricular filling pressure you do it's very high then probably you could deduce that they may not respond to additional fluid boluses or if you have a patient with rv dilatation due to cor pulmonale or pe then obviously you would uh, be tempered about giving more fluids to this patients or uh, by doing echo you may even see if patient is having a lot of pericardial fluid leading to tamponade and even in this situation you would not subject them to fluid boluses so this is a sort of a very intuitive sort of an algorithm that you could keep in mind so if they are obviously uh, hypovolemic you would go ahead and give fluid but if you have a doubt and you subject them to echo i think echo gives lot of information whether this patient would need additional fluid or not okay so what about cvp since cvp has been traditionally used to determine fluid responsiveness as you see i think there is a uh, there is a sort of a literature reference that we should stop using cvp i think there are multiple why is why is it that we have stopped using cvp because there are multiple studies so the study which came by french group was clearly shown that cvp fails to predict cardiac output responsiveness to a fluid bolus and there was a meta analysis which came in 2013 with 23 studies where the predictability was very poor the area under curve was only 0.56 so i think multiple studies based on this literature has shown that cvp is not a good tool to determine whether patients would have good cardiac output responsiveness to fluid and and we have understood from multiple studies that static value of any hemodynamic tool you use cvp or beat others uh, so they can they really uh, will show whether patient is preload responsive or preload unresponsive which means they can indicate either of them so not necessarily you will be able to make a logical conclusion whether they are responsive or non responsive because it can mean anything so i think that is what we understand and why we say that is because a static level of cvp would not really tell you whether patient is on this part of the curve or or in which part of the curve whether they are in ascending part of the curve or whether they are on the plateau phase of the curve 
and the static level of CVP would not tell you uh, the dynamic changes or dynamic changes in the trend that would happen with different types of fluid resuscitation. So that is the whole problem. So it would really not tell you uh, as to which part of the Starling's curve you are in to determine whether there is going to be a cardiac output responsiveness to the fluid. And so is the CVP, all the other static variables of fluid responsiveness like pulmonary artery, occlusive pressure or left ventricular filling pressure or global end diastolic volume, or aortic flow, flow time or left ventricular end diastolic flow, all these are considered static variables. So a single number that you derive from any of these would not tell you which part of the Starling's curve you are in and whether there would be a cardiac output increase when you give a fluid bolus. So that's what we have understood. So we have moved away from static value to dynamic values. I think that is where the whole philosophy has changed with regards to fluid responsiveness. So the survey done in US or Europe suggests that even now 73% of the patients in US or anesthesiologists are depending on CVP as a marker for fluid responsiveness and 84% of anesthesiologists in Europe depend on CVP for their fluid responsiveness. And as I mentioned, CVP could be used as a marker of preload. When I say marker of preload to determine if, if their volume status is low, but that does not mean that their preload response, which means when you give fluid, you do not know for sure whether there is going to be a concomitant cardiac output increase when you give fluid. So it may just tell you, okay, the volume may be little low, but that doesn't mean that they would respond. When, with cardiac output increase when you give fluid. I think that's what we need to clearly understand. So now we are moved to all the dynamic indices of fluid resuscitation or fluid responsiveness. So one of the important dynamic tool of fluid responsiveness is the pulse pressure variation. So pulse pressure variation is simply the changes in the arterial pressure in relation to respiration in mechanically ventilated patients. So if you see so this is an inspiratory curve in a mechanically ventilated and this is an expiratory lump. So if you look at the arterial pressure changes, so during inspiration, as you see in a mechanically ventilated patient, the arterial pressure increases. And during expiration, your arterial pressure comes down. So this variation we quantify to determine if these patients are fluid responsiveness. When I say whether these patients would have an increase in the cardiac output when you give a fluid bonus. So this is what we have understood by pulse pressure variation. And the way we calculate is, so pulse pressure variation is maximum pulse pressure which you take during inspiration whatever is the maximum pulse pressure minus minimum pulse pressure. So during expiration divided by mean pulse pressure. So any change more than 12%, if you have pulse pressure variation of more than 12%, we consider them as fluid responsive. So this is what we have understood. So, so the diagnostic threshold as I said is 12%. So this is if you look at this as a inspiration and if you look at as an expiration. So what happens during inspiration in the lung? So in the lung during inspiration there is increase in the pleural pressure and there is increase in the transpulmonary pressure. So what this does is because there is increase in pleural pressure because so when they are Ventilating during inspiration, your venous return comes down, so your right ventricular preload comes down. And when your right ventricular preload comes down, your right ventricular afterload increases. And this leads to reduction in the right ventricular stroke volume. Okay, and the opposite happens in the left ventricle. In the left ventricle, there is increase in the preload, reduction in the afterload, and there is increase in the stroke volume. So there is reduction in the stroke volume in the right heart there is increase in the stroke volume in the left heart and that leads to maximum pulse pressure. So there is surge in the pulse pressure that you saw in the waveform in the previous slide and your reduced stroke volume which happens redu reduces the pulse pressure during expiration. So these are the typical changes that you saw in the previous slide that during inspiration in mechanically ventilator pulse pressure increases. During expiration it comes down because of fall in the stroke volume in the right ventricle. So these are the changes, physiological changes that determine the change in pulse pressure during inspiration and expiration. So this was a meta-analysis which came in 2014 which showed in 22 studies 807 patients 
looking at pulse pressure variation as a reflection of fluid responsiveness sensitivity was good at 88% and specificity was 89% so it had a good predictability to determine the cardiac output of fluid responsiveness by using pulse pressure variation and this was another study from French group where they showed pulse pressure variation of more than 13% had a good predictive ability for fluid responsiveness and area under curve was 0.98 which was very good but in page but this had a serious problem pulse pressure variation was not very uh, suggestive or uh, was not validated in patients with ARDS where small tidal volume was used where the area of curve was around 0.76. So if you have a patient with ARDS and you are using very small tidal volume then this pulse pressure variation of 13% may not be very reflective. So similar to uh, this pulse pressure variation which happens due to the changes in inspiration and expiration there are other surrogates. So there are other surrogates which have looked at respiratory variations. So one is variation in arterial pulse pressure with volume clamp photoplethysmograph. So this is a non-invasive sort of a cardiac output monitor where you just it's like a, a pulse oximetry probe on a finger. So and you would look at variation in the arterial pulse pressure by this photoplethysmograph which uh, when there is a clamping, so it builds up the trace and measures the cardiac output. So the other surrogate of uh, stroke volume variation with respiration is pulse contour analysis. So pulse contour analysis basically maps the area under the curve and it determines the cardiac output by determining the stroke volume. So when you do pulse contour analysis, what you get is the stroke volume variation which is again calculated by maximum stroke volume minus minimum stroke volume divided by mean and the diagnostic threshold for this is around 18%. So if there is a stroke volume variation of more than 18% in intubated mechanically, it is suggestive of fluid responsiveness. So the other surrogate of stroke volume variation with respiration is your aortic flow. So when you put esophageal Doppler and you determine the aortic flow, flow time. So if there is a variation of around 25%, so it is indicative of fluid responsiveness. So these are the different other tools that we have. So one is pulse pressure variation which is the easiest. Then you have this uh, pulse contour analysis which can be done by Litco catheter or PA catheter or PICO catheter. So you can look at stroke volume variation or you can use the plethysmograph, uh, photoplethysmograph to determine non-invasive cardiac output which also looks at variation in the arterial pulse pressure due to changes in respiration or you put esophageal doppler and look at diurotic flow, flow time difference, alteration of flow time with inspiration and expiration. As you see, this is with inspiration. One is inspiration, it goes up, expiration it comes down. You look at the difference. Okay. So the other easier one to look at bedside, which we do in our practice. So we do in our hospital, pulse pressure variation is something we can look at mechanical ventilated or you can do a simple echo. So in echocardiogram, you can look at LV left ventricular outflow track, velocity, time integral. So it's a very simple um, uh, tool to do. So you just put a sample, just distal to the left ventricular outflow track and you put a pulse wave Doppler, you get a trace like this. So you calculate the left ventricular velocity, uh, left ventricular outflow track, velocity, time integral. And the change in velocity, time integral during inspiration and expiration more than 12% which you calculate by maximum VTI minus minimum VTI divided by mean. So more than 12% is indicative of fluid responsiveness. Else if you are doing this NVOT VTI you can even do a PLR passive leg rising and see if there is an increase in 12% following a passive leg rise and you would know that they are fluid responsiveness. Okay. And sensitivity was found to be 100% and specificity was 89%. But as I said, there are so, so these are the tools which are used as uh, to determine fluid responsiveness in relation to a respiratory variation. So pulse pressure variation is one, stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation with plethysmograph, aortic flow or velocity time integral. So these are all the tools that you have which you could use to determine whether a patient is going to be fluid responsive. But with all these tools, there are certain limitations because all these tools can be used only in mechanically ventilated patients without any spontaneous efforts. 
and patient should not have any arrhythmias whilst you are interpreting this test and as I already mentioned you cannot use these tools in patients with ARDS where you are using low tidal volume because if you are using low tidal volume it may become erroneous so tidal volume should be around 8 ml per kg or more or a heart rate by respiratory rate ratio should be more than 3.6 and your respiratory compliance should be good when you are applying this test should be more than 30 ml which means in ARDS if compliance is less than 30 you cannot use these tools uh, which have which the tools which are correlating to your respiratory variations and patient should not have any significant valvular abnormality. So these are the limitations. So what other tests then we need to look at where we can circumvent these limitations. So as I said, so these are the tests which all uh, you know show erroneous interpretation when you apply these tests in this condition. So there are other conditions which are looked at. So tidal volume challenge test is one which uh, was published in 2016 by our Indian authors. Uh, so this pulse pressure variation which has a limitation when you use lower tidal can be circumvented by using this tidal volume challenge test. So what you do in tidal volume challenge test is you in ARDS patient we assume that patient is being ventilated 6 ml per kg tidal volume you increase to 8 ml per kg tidal volume. So if there is increase in the pulse pressure variation to more than or equal to 3.5% or if there is increase in the stroke volume variation to more than or equal to 2.5% then this is suggestive of fluid responsiveness in patients with ARDS which otherwise you would not have been able to interpret pulse pressure variation stroke volume variation. I think by doing this tidal volume challenge test if there is an increase in PPV or SVV more than 2.5, more than 3.5 respectively, it will tell you that these patients could be fluid responsive. So now we'll move to variation of vena cable diameter. I think this is something we use commonly in our ICU. So we need to have clarity as to how we interpret this. So what we understand is the change in the intrathoracic pressure will cause variability of SVC and IVC. So for doing SVC variability, we need to do TO, transesophageal echo. We cannot do SVC variability with transthoracic echo. And the diagnostic threshold for looking at SVC variability is around 40%. This is in mechanically ventilated. For IVC variability, diagnostic threshold is 12%. So in, pa in patients, in septic patients, the vena cable diameter as a tool to indicate preload responsiveness was found to be poor. I think that, that these are the multiple studies and the accuracy of the vena cable diameter could be influenced by your tidal volume and lung compliance. So they do have bearing on your interpretation of vena cable diameter and the vena cable diameter as a tool to determine preload responsiveness was poor in spontaneously breathing patients and that came from the Canadian study and it was poor in emergency patients because most of the emergency patients, emergency patients are spontaneously breathing. So your interpretation of vena cable diameter as a responsiveness, as a fluid responsiveness in spontaneously breathing patients was found to be poor in the recent studies that came in. Okay, And this was a meta-analysis which came in 2014, 8 studies, the vena cable diameter sensitivity was 76% and specificity was 86%. So I think what do we understand by vena cable diameter? So basically you put a probe on the subst on the ziffy sternum, 1 cm lateral. So you look at you look at IVC. If IVC is less than 1 cm, it roughly indicates your CVP is low. If it is more than 2 cm, then it roughly indicates that probably the CVP is high and patient is volumic or has enough volume on board. So in mechanically ventilated once you put a you look at the IVC you put them on a M mode. So in mechanically ventilated patients you can do two measurements of IVC. So one is IVC diameter variability. Diameter variability where you measure take a maximum IVC minus minimum IVC divided by mean IVC. If it is more than 12 this is in mechanically ventilated which we, we do in our patients. So if it is more than 12% then you would know this patient is fluid responsiveness. Or you can do distensibility index where you look at maximum IVC 
minus minimum IVC divided by minimum diameter. If it is more than 18 percent, then you would consider them as fluidus. This is in mechanically ventilated patients. How about in spontaneous breathing? In spontaneously breathing, we use collapsibility index, which is maximum IVC diameter minus minimum IVC diameter divided by maximum. If it is more than 40 percent, it is suggestive of fluid response. Although I have said all these, if you see the recent studies in spontaneously breathing patients, IVC predictability did not look great. So in mechanically ventilated, as you saw from the Chinese study, the sensitivity was around 78 percent and specificity was 86 percent as you saw in this study. So you could use this as an adjunct, but in spontaneously breathing, you, uh, I think you may not be wanting to rely completely on this because you know the we are sort of moving away from it as a very good indicator of fluid responsiveness and they've even done right IJV distensibility index so this was a study which came by US group but diagnostic accuracy of this IJV was found to be very low okay so this is about your IVC diameter so in mechanically ventilated you can do two distensibility index or what we do is diameter variability variability so that is divided by mean maximum minus minimum divided by mean more than 12 percent you would consider as responsiveness so we'll move to other indices which is which is more topical and which we believe is now current is passive leg rising so passive leg rising basically you the patient who is supine you uh, you know who is propped up you make him supine and raise the legs so it's an auto fluid challenge around 300 ml blood from your peripheries move to the central compartment and you look at change in cardiac load. so there is a movement of blood from the extremities and from the truncal blood into the central circulation and the amount of blood that would move is around 300 ml so it is a self preload challenge and you look at the change in cardiac output or change in pulse pressure you could look either of them the level of recommendation for change in cardiac output is strong recommendation uh, for change in pulse pressure variation is a little weaker recommendation. So if you have a change in cardiac output of more than 10 percent then you know these patients are fluid responsiveness. This more than 10 percent change in cardiac output you could use any of these devices. You could use photoplethysmograph which is a non-invasive cardiac output or you can put esophageal doppler and look at the change in stroke volume or pulse contour analysis using any of the tools PICO, LITCO, PA catheter. So any of these you can look to look at the pulse contour or, or Vigilio or you can do an echocardiogram look at the velocity time integral and look at the change of 10 percent. So any of these tools you can see after passive leg rising test and determine whether they are fluid responsive or not. The advantages of passive leg rising test is this can be used in spontaneously breathing patients. As you saw the pulse pressure variation we could not use for spontaneously. It can be used only in mechanical ventilation. This can be used in spontaneously breathing. It can be used in an arrhythmias which you could not use in pulse pressure variation. You could use it even in ARDS patients, low tidal volume or you could use, an, use even in patients with low lung complaints. All these were contraindications for pulse pressure variation or the stroke volume variation. In mechanical ventilator. So, but the passive leg rising you could use in a, all these conditions which were otherwise contraindications. Okay. So, if you do not have any of those gadgets, I think the simple thing you can do if you do not even have arterial line, the, I think this was a study which came from the Dutch group. So, you measure the blood pressure when patient is supine like this and you make him flat and raise the extremities, wait for 60 to 90 seconds and measure the blood pressure and then you measure the pulse pressure what is the pulse pressure here what is that and look at the change in we call it as a delta pulse pressure if it is more than 15 percent it is indicative of fluid responsiveness so this was a study to look at the sensitivity of passive leg raising test so this was a study uh, meta-analysis which came by the monet group from the france which was done in thousand patients including 21 studies and they found the sensitivity of passive leg rising test to cardiac output change was very good 85 percent and specificity was 91 percent but when you look at passive leg rising test and correlation with pulse pressure variation sensitivity was poor but specificity was good so what this tells you is when you are doing passive leg rising test it is good to look at the cardiac output responsiveness as opposed to pulse pressure variation 
because you may have to depend more on cardiac output measurement rather than the pulse pressure variation because for pulse pressure obviously you would expect them to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. So when you are doing passive leg rising test, so this was another study which was done in 65 patients looking at the end tidal CO2. So you have these patients connected who are intubated mechanically ventilated for an end tidal CO2, you do a passive leg rising and then you will check for ETCO2 change that happens after passive leg rising. If there is increase in the ETCO2 of more than 5% after you do passive leg rising, then it is indicative of fluid responsiveness. So, so that was validated in this particular study. So then there are newer tests that have come. So this is one end expiratory occlusion test. So what you do here is when you are ventilating any patient, when you are, when you are insufflating air or gas into the patient, so there is impairment of the venous return. We understand that. And this impairment of the venous return reduces the right ventricular preload. So the whole philosophy is if you interrupt this insufflation by doing end expiratory activity. So it is like how you check intrinsic PEEP. When you are checking intrinsic PEEP, you put an end expiratory hold. Same thing you do here where you are putting end expiratory hold for more than 15 seconds. By doing this, you are negating this impairment of venous return and there is increase in the preload. Ordinarily, because of your ongoing insufflation, there is reduction in the preload. So you are holding this insufflation for about 15 seconds and seeing increase in the preload. So this was done again by Monet from the French group. So if you do this end expiratory occlusion for more than 15 seconds and you see an increase in cardiac output of more than 5%, it is indicative of fluid responsiveness. And this measurement in cardiac output again could be done by non-invasive cardiac output monitor or by your pulse contour analysis by LITCO, PICO or any of the tools or by doing echocardiogram. So you do that and demonstrate increase in the cardiac output of more than 5% then it means these patients are fluid responsive. And this end expiratory occlusion test was validated in patients with ARDS and in patients with PEEP from, uh, from 5 to 15. And, it, and this was shown to have good sensitivity and specificity. So this is another technique to determine that if patients are fluid responsive. So then the concept changed from fluid challenge, whether you would give maxi fluid challenge or mini fluid challenge. So what we understood is the main drawback of giving any fluid is that we need to measure cardiac output to determine whether they are truly fluid responsiveness. Otherwise, if you are just giving fluid responsiveness and look at looking at clinical endpoints, then it is more therapeutic rather than being any diagnostic value. And what they have shown is, this was a study from the Belgian group where they showed the change in arterial pressure you see after you give fluid not necessarily correlated with the change in cardiac output. So which means a patient comes hypotensive, you give fluid resuscitation, just because there may be increase in blood pressure not necessarily means that is increase in the cardiac output. So there was no correlation. So that was the finding they had. So if patient is hemodynamically unstable and he has four to five episodes of hypotension, suppose in an ICU in 24 hours, and you are given four to five allocates of 500 ml fluids, then you would have loaded your patient with two to 2.5 liters, and which may amount to fluid overload in patients who may be having left ventricular or myocardial dysfunction. And that may reduce your oxygen delivery leading to tissue ischemia and organ dysfunction. So this was the concept they came with a mini fluid concept. Mini fluid is where you give 100 ml colloid and look at the change in velocity time integral. And this was shown to have good correlation with fluid responsiveness. So if there is 10% increase in the velocity time integral by giving 100 ml colloid which you again measure by your pulse contour analysis. So it was suggestive of fluid responsiveness. But there is a problem. So we do not know whether 100 ml colloid is the right amount, 50 ml also will suffice or whether it should be 4 ml per kg. So what they have found is 50 ml is not enough and 4 ml per kg over 5 minutes was found to be minimal. So if you are having a 60 kilo gentleman, so you would have to give 240 to 250 ml. So it was so there is an ambiguity. What is the right amount of fluid to call it as a mini fluid? 
although this study was done with 100 ml colloid but with crystalloids it may be 4 ml per kg or 5 minutes what may be needed to call it as a mini fluid because if you give less they may not be fluid responsiveness and another problem by doing mini fluid is you have, since the change is very minimal because it's only 10 percent increase in the velocity i think your tools to measure cardiac output should be very accurate so the take home message will be just following this algorithm which i'll show you i think that should suffice on our understanding of fluid responsiveness so you basically any patient comes see if blood pressure is low or cardiac output is low or whether there is signs of tissue hypoperfusion whether it is yes or no if there is no signs of tissue hypoperfusion or blood pressure is not low then you don't have to load them with fluids if the answer is yes then you would look for whether there is any obvious fluid loss or whether there are in initial phases of septic shock so if there is no obvious fluid loss or initial phases of septic shock if there is obvious fluid loss then you would give fluid expansion or if there are initial phases of septic shock you wouldn't subject them to test for fluid responsiveness you will just start giving fluids if the answer is no so if you if you look at the patient and you say there's no obvious fluid loss or there's no obvious features of hypovolemia then you would have to subject them to test for preload responsiveness so and then you need to see whether patient is having cardiac arrhythmias or ARDS if your answer is patient has cardiac arrhythmias or ARDS then you have to subject them to passive leg rising test and see if passive leg rising leads to increase in cardiac output or you can do end expiratory occlusion test if they are mechanically ventilated or you can do mini fluid challenge look at increase in the velocity time integral by 10 percent so if patient is not spontaneously breathing if they are mechanically ventilated so this is in spontaneous breathing you can do passive leg raising or mini fluid chain for index pressure occlusion test they have to be ventilated but if patient is fully ventilated relaxed and there is no ARDS lung compliance is good then you can subject them to pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation and you can look at respiratory variation of IVC so vena cable diameter variation is something you can look at and you can subject again to any of these tests passive leg rising mini fluid or index pressure occlusion so as you see from this algorithm I think the easiest way for us to determine fluid responsiveness is passive leg rise because when you do passive leg you are giving their own auto fluid bolus and the easiest one is to do an echo and look at the change in the velocity time integral or if they have a non-invasive cardiac output just connect them to that and look for a change in cardiac output of more than 10 percent then that would very precisely tell you if they are fluid responsive that's the easiest one so if you have patient if you have a monitor with pulse pressure variation the second easiest would be pulse pressure variation so if your patient is intubated mechanically ventilated no ARDS and you're have achieving tidal volume of more than 6 ml then you can subject them to pulse pressure variation so most monitors so in our practice we have ppv so we check if there is increase in the ppv of more than 12 percent then you know they are fluid responsiveness and you could give little fluids so i think this algorithm really summarizes the whole advances in fluid responsiveness to uh, and the volume responsiveness so i think i would end with this cartoon i think our whole understanding of fluid responsiveness is something like this i think it is evolved uh, over two decades we have been contemplating as what is the right method and we are coming with new tools new gadgets and i think we still are groping in the dark to determine the easiest tool with 100 percent certainty that which patients are fluid responsiveness so thank you very much so i request everyone to visit this website if you want to revisit or rehear my lecture you can visit this website and uh, go through the lecture to gain clarity over the whole concept of fluid responsiveness thank you very much